All right, Facebook Live, excited to be on with you guys today. And I uh, got something special for you guys. I know a lot of you guys have been asking about lab testing and how I look at lab testing and what's difference, the difference really between how a clinical doctor, clinical medical doctor will look at labs and how a functional medicine practitioner will look at labs. And so that's really my plan today is to do a screen share and actually go through a sample lab with you guys. So if you've had recent labs, like a complete blood count, a comprehensive metabolic panel where they're looking at electrolytes and liver enzymes and white blood cells and red blood cells, and maybe you had your vitamin D tested, and maybe you had C-reactive protein levels tested, maybe you had your thyroid levels tested. That is really what we're going to be looking at today. So, um, so look out for that. Let me see how I can do this here. Okay. All right, cool. So there we go. Blood and thyroid testing. That is what I'm going to be focusing on today. So hopefully this is a good topic for you guys. I don't plan on being on for very long. So if you can hang with me just for a few minutes, um, we're going to get started here with looking at blood and thyroid testing and uh, going through an actual panel, right? And actually showing you that on my screen. And so let's see who's on with us. We got Mitch, Mitchell Van. Uh, hey, Mitch, great to be on with you. Uh, great that, that you're here. So Mitch is a actually a patient at my clinic. So excited that you're on with us today. We've got Hope. Um, she says, you're so helpful. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. And hopefully this, um, this little video right here will be really helpful for you guys. Wendy says, oh, hi. So hey, Wendy, great to have you on as well. Kate is on. Good morning, Dr. Jockers. Having a great day with snow outside. Awesome. That's great, Kate. Today in Atlanta, Georgia, it's actually beautiful. Sunny. It was rainy all day yesterday. Sunny out here. Uh, weather is fantastic. So um, don't miss the snow, that's for sure. But I hope you enjoy it there. Let's see. Davida is from North Northern California. So great to have you on with us, Davida. And really uh, just an honor and a privilege that those of you guys that are on are on. <laughs> and um, you know, definitely chime in from where you're coming in from. And also I'll be answering some questions that you guys have too. So would love to uh, be able to answer any questions that you might have. All right. Now here is the test, the first test. It is, can we see or uh, can I uh, can I share my screen? So let's see if I can do this. This kind of text stuff sometimes can be a little bit confusing, but let's see if you guys can see that. All right, let me jump back and let's see. All right, so hopefully you guys can see the lab test there. That is my hope and let me go through this. Okay, so this again is a sample run. I'm just trying to see if I can kind of figure out this software for you guys. Um, but basically, we're looking at our total thyroid or our complete thyroid test that we run off of our website. And we are starting by looking at the complete blood count. So it's the CBC with differential and platelets. And so I'm looking at white blood cells, red blood cells, hemoglobin, hematocrit, all of this kind of stuff. So when I'm looking at this, white blood cells normally should be between five and eight. So what would make white blood cells higher? Like this person has 5.8. So if they're up over eight, then that could be a signal that that individual is having some sort of an acute infection, okay? Or maybe some sort of major inflammatory storm, autoimmune inflammatory storm. If the white blood cells are real low, that would be an indication that they have immune suppression, that their immune system is being suppressed and they're not producing enough of these white blood cells to keep their body protected from infections. And oftentimes chronic infections can cause that sort of white blood cell issue. And so hopefully you guys are able to see that. Can, um, can you guys go ahead and let me know in the comments if you're able to see that lab? That would be great. All right, we got Emmett Blonick from Madison, my good friend. It's great to have you on, Emmett. We've got Maria. She says, hello, Dr. Jockers. How much kelp can be taken for your thyroid? 
It's a great question. And so, um, yeah, kelp can be very, very beneficial because it's loaded with micronutrients and trace minerals, and that can be very helpful for thyroid. So if you have hyperthyroid, I would stay away from kelp. So Graves' disease or hyperthyroidism. Um, but if you have hypothyroidism or just in general, you're trying to have good thyroid health, then some good organic kelp can be beneficial. All right. So guys, can you guys see the lab test? Okay. So let's see. Everybody says they can see it, but it looks small. Okay. Well, um, so I think the best I can do for you guys right now, let's, uh, let's see if it looks any bigger now. I don't think so. But uh, we'll, we'll jump back into the topic, though. And so anyways, I'm looking here, white blood cells, red blood cells. So typically, um, you know, if red blood cells are very low, okay, for example, like under four, then that's going to be a sign possibly of an anemia. Maybe that person's bleeding out. Maybe they've got some sort of iron deficiency that could be taking place. Okay, so we're looking out for that. Could be B12 deficiency as well. In fact, when I look at the size of the blood vessels, the MCV, MHC, which is all has to do with like the volume and the size of the blood vessels, I'm looking to see if there's issues with methylation or maybe iron deficiency. So lower numbers there would indicate iron deficiency. High numbers would indicate possibly like a B12 or folate deficiency. So typically ideal range is 85 to 92. On this test, it is at 89. So that's a, that's a good range. Okay, when I'm looking at the breakdown of white blood cells, neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, basophils, the neutrophils normally should be between 40 to 60% of the total of the white blood cells. So it's a breakdown of the white blood cells. If they're up over 60%, it oftentimes can be indicative of a bacteria or yeast overgrowth in the body, and the body's trying to attack that. Could also be just a really, you know, chronic inflammation or autoimmunity can also cause high neutrophils as well. Um, if lymphocytes, lymphocytes should be between 20 and 40. So if they're high, if they're real high, then oftentimes neutrophils might, might actually be lower. And if lymphocytes are high, it's often an indication of a virus. So it could have been an acute virus, like that person may have had a cold or a fever or flu, like a viral flu. Um, or it could be uh, chronic, where they may have like an Epstein-Barr virus or cytomegalovirus or something along those lines. Monocytes, monocytes, if they are very high, like up over eight or nine, so this one's at seven, which is borderline high. Um, if they're up over that, then we're, we're thinking, especially if lymphocytes are high, possibly mononucleosis, which would be Epstein-Barr virus. Eosinophils should be three or less. If they're up over three, like this person has four, it's a sign of either an allergy or possibly like they may have like a pollen allergy or, um, or a food allergy or something like that, that they're being exposed to or dust mite allergy or a parasite. So eosinophils will rise with parasites. So just so you guys know. So as we drop down a little bit lower, glucose, you see this person has 105 on their glucose levels, which is high. And so we want that to be lower, obviously. So your fasting blood glucose ideally is going to be somewhere between like 70 and 90. Okay. Somewhere around that range. If you're very keto adapted, it could be lower than that. Uh, so this person's got either high cortisol or possibly insulin resistance. So if I want to look for insulin resistance, I can actually drop down and look at hemoglobin A1C. So this person's at 5.6. The ideal range for hemoglobin A1C is going to be 4.5 to 5.2. So 5.6 is pre is is very close to being what's considered pre-diabetic, which would be 5.7. So this person may have blood sugar fluctuations, and we're seeing that in the morning their blood sugar is 105. So they probably have high cortisol in the morning, uh, which could be a sign that they're not sleeping well. Maybe they have sleep apnea or just chronic mouth breathing. Maybe they're not sleeping well in general. That oftentimes can cause this high cortisol and uh, blood sugar imbalances in the morning. They might be under a lot of stress. They might be relying on like a really loud alarm to wake them up, which can certainly cause higher cortisol in the morning as well. So those are things that we're looking at there. Uh, jumping back into, let's go to liver enzymes. So AST, ALT, ideally I like to see them between 10 and 21 certainly not above 25 or 26. This person's at 26 and 24. 
maybe a little bit of borderline stress on their liver, probably not anything too significant, but maybe a little bit of borderline stress. If it's, if it's really low liver enzymes, real low AST and ALT, oftentimes it's a sign of a B6 deficiency. If it's real high, up over 26 in the 30s or 40s, could be a sign of liver stress, possibly um, a fatty liver disease that could be developing or maybe a virus like a hepatitis that's affecting the liver. These are possible things that could be taking place. Um, let's see, alkaline phosphatase. So that should be, I, I typically like to see that between 60 and 90. On this lab test, it's at 73, which is ideal. If it's down around 50 or less, it's a sign typically of a zinc deficiency, maybe vitamin C as well. So we're looking at that. Um, but oftentimes zinc, because that's very much zinc related, alkaline phosphatase. <clears throat> so we're looking at that. When it's real high, it's typically a sign of liver gallbladder issue. Now with kids, kids or anybody that's growing or if you broke broke a bone and the bone's regrowing, you're all, you're naturally going to have higher alkaline phosphatase. It's going to be up way over 90, oftentimes like 150, even up to 200 for kids because they are growing. So their body needs that alkaline phosphatase for bone growth. All right. Now let's drop down triglycerides and cholesterol. So hopefully you guys are getting a lot of value out of this. Let me jump back, take a look at who is on here. Hopefully you guys are getting a lot of value. If you are, let me know that you're getting value and um, what else you want me to discuss when it comes to blood testing here. Kate says, yes, my blood sugar levels are difficult for me. I go high and low all day. I have to check it almost twice a day because I do get very dizzy otherwise. Yeah, this is common. And so, you know, with this, we definitely want to make sure we're adding in more healthy fats. Fats will provide more satiety, really help balance out the blood sugar. So I highly recommend getting more fats, avocados, olives, olive oil, MCT oil, coconut, coconut fats, getting more of those in the diet will help create more balance and stability in that. All right, let's see, Mary is on. She says, I love your work. Thank you, Mary. I'm a holistic nurse and share your information with my clients. You're the best. Do you recommend selenium with those with Hashimoto's? It's a great question, Mary, and, and thank you again for sharing my information. I'm a huge fan of selenium for thyroid issues. Hashimoto's, Graves disease, so hyper hypothyroidism. Even if it's not Hashimoto's, if it's like a T4 to T3 conversion issue due to estrogen dominance, um, or maybe gut dysfunction, selenium can be really, really helpful. So uh, typically I'm recommending somewhere between 100 to 400 micrograms of selenium. Uh, it's typically a selenium amino acid uh, chelate, like selenomethionine can be really good for that. So uh, that's very helpful. Let's see, Joy says, Hashimoto with celiac and diverticulitis. What diet do you suggest to lose weight? Sorry to hear about these health issues, Joy. Um, well, in general, I mean, celiac means obviously you're gluten intolerant. So we definitely got to go, you know, I, well, I recommend that for everybody, but I would recommend my autoimmune elimination program, which is an elimination. It's a low carb, but not keto, but nevertheless, low carb elimination diet program um, designed to really eliminate the most common food sensitivities and heal and restore function of the gut. So that's really what I would focus on with that. So sorry to hear about those health issues. And also, uh, for those of you guys that don't know, if you are in the Atlanta area, I'm actually doing an advanced training at my clinic, Exodus Health Center, tomorrow at 12 p.m. So I don't do these trainings very often. And this is, you know, an opportunity to come to the clinic and really get an advanced uh, training with with a relatively small group of people uh, where we'll really dive into these topics, get your, your questions answered right there in person. So if you're in the Atlanta area, I uh, really hope you can make it out to my clinic, Exodus Health Center. It's going to be from 12 to 1 tomorrow. So check that out. If you're not, then hopefully this presentation here, uh, this connection that we have on Facebook or YouTube, if you're listening later on YouTube, uh, will really help answer a lot of the questions that you guys have. And so I'm going to do my best to help you guys with that. Let's see, Paul, what's going on, Paul? Paul's a patient at Exodus Health Center. Love this guy. Paul is awesome. He says, how much salt needed on keto? We got Paul on keto diet. Uh, you know, it's going to range for everybody, Paul. Typically, I recommend trying to get about two teaspoons of good high quality, like a pink salt. 
every day. Now, that's not like just taking a spoonful of salt and putting it in your mouth. I wouldn't recommend that. You'll probably gag if you do that, or you'll have diarrhea because your body will just try to get that out of your system. Too much salt can be toxic, but salting your foods well. So just kind of put salt on. Don't over salt, but just uh, put salt to taste is a really good idea. You can also use a lot of trace mineral rich foods, which in general, the way I teach a ketogenic program, uh, we, that's what we do. We use things like sea vegetables, seafood, like sea, um, like fish, which can be wild caught fish, really rich in, uh, in, in sodium, natural sodium, celery, cucumbers, uh, dark green leafy vegetables in general, avocados, very rich in trace minerals. Yeah, and just salt to taste is really the best idea. So you're not trying to avoid salt, you're just trying to salt to taste. So great questions. All right, let's jump back into this lab test a little bit. So now I'm gonna talk about cholesterol, triglycerides, and HDL, LDL, right? The good, bad cholesterol, things that we've learned. So total cholesterol, this person on the sample test, if you can see it, total cholesterol is at 235, which is marked as high. Anything over 200 is marked as high on the lab, but I don't consider that high. So if I just look at the total cholesterol, unless it's like up over 350, I'm not going to like immediately consider that high. All right. I'm just going to say, okay, you know what? That's not necessarily high. Let's look at everything else. In fact, the cholesterol, in my opinion, cholesterol of like 250, 235 is actually very healthy as long as the ratios of the types of cholesterol and the triglyceride to HDL is, is good. So this person's triglycerides are at 83. All right, which is pretty good because we want our triglycerides to be under 100. You're always trying to get your triglycerides under 100. HDL is at 63. Ideal range that I like to see HDL is typically 50 to 80, maybe up to 90. All right, if HDL is really high, it's, it's a, oftentimes a sign of inflammation or maybe an infection. If HDL is really low, it's typically a sign of insulin resistance. That person has real poor blood sugar signaling. Uh, maybe a low-fat diet, too, could also cause it and, and inability to absorb fat-soluble nutrients, so uh, like a, like a uh, malabsorption. Somebody with celiac disease may have very low HDL due to malabsorption. Triglycerides, if they're really high, it's, if they're up over 100, I'm thinking insulin resistance, uh, you know, blood sugar issues. If they're really low, like under 40, then I'm thinking malabsorption. Again, like a celiac type issue with malabsorption. Now, triglycerides at 83, HDL at 63, pretty good. We want that triglyceride to HDL ratio should always be two or less, two or less. And so for this individual, it's pretty good because it's, it's, it's close to one. I want it to, I want it to be as close to one as possible. So if your HDL is 63, ideally your triglycerides are around that same amount, 63. So that's typically what we're looking at. LDL, you want your LDL to HDL cholesterol to be three or less. So this person's at 137 with their LDL, 63 with their HDL. So if we break that down, it's like 2.1. Uh, so basically, very good ratio. So that's that's where we want it. So that's really good. Um, that's that's a good cholesterol panel right there. It's that's good. That's a sign that this person, in general, uh, you know, doesn't have significant insulin resistance. We saw that hemoglobin A1C a little higher than what I'd like to see it, but uh, nevertheless, cholesterol is not out of whack. And what that tells me is that most likely this person's cholesterol uh, are th they're going to have a majority very large, fluffy types of cholesterol that have a lot of fat soluble antioxidants, vitamin A, E, D, things like that. Because our LDL helps bring fat soluble antioxidants out to the cells, which is really important. HDL helps carry the waste back. So we actually need a lot of LDL, especially for healing. It's really, really important. If that person has really high LDL, I'm thinking insulin resistance or very commonly a thyroid issue. So if you have poor T4 to T3 conversion or Hashimoto's where you have autoimmunity to your thyroid, uh, something along those lines, you oftentimes will have very high LDL cholesterol. And if you go into your doctor, oftentimes they're going to add, they're going to tell you, you need a thyroid, you need a uh, cholesterol medication without ever dressing your thyroid, which is very incorrect. So that's not something we want to do. All right. Now let's look at thyroid TSH. Ideally, that should be around 0 0.5 to maybe up to two maybe a little bit less than two, like 1.8. If it's high, it's a sign that your brain to thyroid connection isn't working good. Your brain's screaming at your thyroid to produce hormone. It could be due to uh, basically high levels of stress can cause high TSH. 
It could be due to just poor functioning thyroid, where the thyroid, maybe it's being attacked due to autoimmunity. Maybe um, the thyroid's producing enough T4, but it's not converting well to T3 through the liver and the gut. Maybe your body has chronic inflammation that's kind of messing with the messaging from the brain thyroid. So you got to look at all those things. Now, T4, that's thyroid hormone, but it's inactive thyroid hormone. That should ideally be between 6 and 12. So if it's up, ideally, you know, the ideal range for that is going to be like more like 8 to, to 10 or 11. Uh, somewhere in that range is really good thyroid hormone production. If it is up really high, like over 12, it's a sign of too much thyroid hormone production, which could be the case for somebody with, Hashi with uh, Graves' disease, for example, um, hyperthyroidism, or sometimes people are over, you know, they're taking too much thyroid medication. And sometimes I'll see that where they have a very high T4. Um, so that's what we're looking at. Low T4 is a sign that thyroid's not producing enough thyroid hormone, and they could use a boost thyroid medication or either, you know, whether they're going to their conventional doc and getting a thyroid medication or doing some sort of a glandular like nature thyroid or, or uh, armor thyroid or our thyroid strong, something, some sort of a boost for the uh, T4 levels. Okay. So we looked at that. All right. Iron. Iron is very important too. You see the iron binding capacity right there, which is low. So this person actually has you know, a lot of iron in their system. And so iron serum is actually in a good range. Iron saturation is actually pretty high right here at 36%. So we got to look at the ferritin levels and their ferritin is at 350, right? And th that's really high. So ferritin ideally for men should be roughly somewhere between 50 and 150 for women, 25 to 100. Low levels of ferritin are going to indicate more of an anemic state. So like kind of this, uh, this form, this iron storage form, it's going to be, it's going to be more anemia and high ferret ferritin. Like this individual is either iron overload, which I don't see that because I would see all their iron pan levels, uh, showing high, but it could also be a sign of oxidative stress and inflammation. So that's another factor there. Um, all right, let's jump back to hemoglobin A1C. Again, I like to see that 4.5 to 5.2. Hemoglobin A1C is like a 90 to 120 day look at the blood cells and how much glycation, how much damage has occurred due to sugar. Um, and that's going to look at that and what percentage have basically glycated. And so ideally we want this range between more of a 4.5 to 5.2, which will show for like basically a lower fasting blood sugar in that 80, 90 kind of range, 5.6, a little higher in the hundreds. So the sinus person's having some blood sugar imbalances that are taking place where blood sugar is going up and down. Uh, let's see, T free T4. So we have things uh, like thyroid binding globulin that can come out that, that are in our bloodstream that can bind to T4, for example, like estrogen dominance, you're going to have higher thyroid binding globulin levels. So you may, so it would impact your free thyroid hormone, right? You're both your T4 and T3. And so estrogen dominance very much associated with low thyroid function, as opposed to somebody who actually has real high testosterone. Testosterone could actually cause very low hormone binding, which could actually lead to higher thyroid production. So just some of the dynamics there. Now reverse T3, there's also a reverse T3, which basically inactivates our T, which is an inactive form of T3. T3 is normally our active thyroid hormone. That's an inactive form, which is reverse T3. If that, I see that real high, it's typically due to high cortisol. So high stress hormone uh, production. We need to really manage that more effectively with good sleep, good nutrition, maybe some adaptogenic herbs, magnesium, B vitamins, things like that. Vitamin D, this person's at 65.3. I ideally like to see vitamin D between 60 and 100 nanograms per milliliter. This person's in a good range. Okay, so 60 to 100 is typically where you want to be. C-reactive protein, marker of inflammation. Typically always want to see this under 2. And ideally under one, this person's at 0 0.58. That's good. It's a good marker. Uh, that's a good low level of C-reactive protein. Okay, so that's good. Now, let's take a look at this. Homocysteine. Homocysteine, ideally range should be around six to nine. Okay, six to nine uh, unit moles uh, per liter. 
This person's at 11.5. High homocysteine up over nine is indicative or it's associated, I should say, with um, higher risk of stroke and Alzheimer's disease. So we want to get that down. Now, homocysteine actually is a precursor to glutathione. It's part of the methionine, this uh, amino acid metabolism. And our body can actually convert methionine, this amino acid, into glutathione, which is our body's master antioxidant. But along the way, it's going to form homocysteine. And this is normal and natural. We're all going to have homocysteine. But we got to keep it under control. we got to get good conversion. So B vitamins are really key. So vitamin B2, riboflavin. Um, so that's B2. B6 is important for this. B9, which is folate. B12. And then also zinc and magnesium, all key for homocysteine and getting uh, and glutathione production. So we, we've got to address those areas. T3, you can see 98. It's actually low. We want that up over 100. Okay. So again, this person's got some level of inflammation because of that serum ferritin being high. Magnesium is at 2.0. I typically like to see it a little bit higher, 2.2, maybe up to 2.5. They could certainly use some extra magnesium support. Uh, let's see, thyroid antibodies are low, thyroid peroxidase there, uh, thyroid binding globulins balanced, and our free T3, though, is low, 2.6. Free T3 ideally should be between 3 and 4, and up closer to 3.5. So for this individual, they're definitely not getting the best um, T4 to T3 conversion taking place. So they're free T3 isn't exactly where we want it. And I see this very commonly with a lot of people. Now, based on what I'm seeing, I'm thinking we need to address blood sugar stability. We're also going to need to address a little bit with stress. Okay. Um, and I think that th that's important and also liver. So that individual could definitely use some overall support in those areas. So in order to help them. So I might use things like maybe our gut healing protein to help support or like our thyro liver protect, which has got the selenium in there. Um, it's also got uh, things to help boost up glutathione. Certainly B vitamins are going to be important for them. So maybe a good high quality multivitamin, right? And that's probably the most important thing that they can do at this point is a good high quality methylated B vitamin that has high doses of chromium and vanadium uh, which help with blood sugar sensitivity can be really helpful for that person. So we have something called high energy support that I'll oftentimes use, which is good for blood sugar, also has the methylated B vitamins that can be supportive. Now, we did see the high eosinophils on that individual as well, which is basically common with, with parasites. So that individual has got mildly elevated liver enzymes and also uh, the higher eosinophils. So maybe some sort of an allergy or sensitivity um, or possibly an issue with with, uh, with a parasite in there. So I would need further testing to really dive into that. But we know there's some inflammation going on because they have that high serum ferritin. So we want to address that too. Um, and so, yeah, all of those things uh, we need to look at further knowing the person's history, any previous lab testing, symptoms they're experiencing, but hopefully this guy, this gives you, you know, some guidance. Now, when I'm looking at T4 to T3 conversion, when it comes to thyroid, I'm thinking, hey, we need to make sure, again, liver's functioning well, gut's functioning well. Also, key nutrients like selenium and zinc, very important for T4 to T3 conversion. Having enough selenium, having enough zinc. So, uh, so supporting those nutrients can be very, very helpful for this. So hopefully uh, you guys are getting a lot of value out of this. And again, if you're in the Atlanta area, I am doing an advanced training on this tomorrow at my clinic, Exodus Health Center, 12 o'clock from 12 to 1 uh, in Kennesaw, Georgia. So you can check that out. So let's see what questions people have here. All right, let's see. Jane says, low triglycerides, 65. Okay, 65 is good. That's what you want, low triglycerides. Okay, Stuart says, what does EMF poison do to blood sugar? Great question. So yeah, if you're very sensitive to EMFs, electromagnetic frequencies, then definitely it can increase your blood sugar. Anything that's going to stress, put a lot of stress in your body, the way your body responds to stress is through a fight or flight mechanism, activating the sympathetic nervous system, which is going to increase your blood sugar. So yeah, definitely EMF stress. If that's a factor, uh, it's definitely going to play a role with that. 
Okay, Wendy says, come to Seattle. Yep, so Seattle would definitely be a great place to visit. So if you want to set up a talk, uh, let's do it. Okay, let's see. Emmett says, my wife did Dr. Jocker's autoimmune elimination program. Yes, that is my program that I do with people. Um, and we're actually revamping it. We're actually uh, really going through and um, updating all the content on there here now too. So if you've purchased that program in the past, then definitely check it out again because we've uh, updated a lot of most of the content so far. And uh, if you haven't gotten that, then that's definitely a great go-to program for anybody dealing with chronic inflammation, autoimmunity, um, thyroid issues. It's really my go-to program. Okay, let's see. Okay, Elvira says, thanks for the info, doctor. You're very welcome. Glad to have you on. Joy says, I'm watching this at work. Any way you have a way to have this on your website to watch again later? Great question, Joy. By the way, anytime I do these Be Live uh, Facebook Lives, you can count on that going on my YouTube channel. So if you just search me on YouTube, um, you'll be able to see this later on today. And you'll also be able to pull up all my other videos. So I'm actually adding two to three videos every week onto my YouTube channel. So check that out and uh, you can subscribe to that so you can get all of, all of my, my latest videos. Okay, Magdalena says, I've started block fasting, 48 hours once a month, great idea. So that's a longer fast. That's what a block fast is, more than a day. And daily intermittent fasting, 12 to 16 hours, and noticed weight gain. What are the possible causes? What should I focus on? If I do not fast, I eat low carb, high fat with tons of vegetables. This is a great question, Magdalena. So obviously, if you're fasting, you normally should lose weight. because You're not taking in as much calories. So if you're at noticing weight gain, there may be an underlying issue with your thyroid. Okay, so I would recommend getting this total thyroid or complete thyroid test that we have on our website. Uh, that way we can analyze what's going on with the thyroid because the thyroid, if it's shutting down, if it's going into hibernation mode, may need a little kickstart. Okay, and one thing you can do is also off of your fast, all right, you can have one day a week where you do higher amount of carbs, maybe up around 100, maybe 150 grams of carbs, more of like a feast day. Since you're incorporating inter daily intermittent fasting and a, a block fast and doing more of a keto approach, your body may need to know that it's not in hibernation mode. It's not being calorie restricted all the time. So believe it or not, even though it sounds counterintuitive, getting some insulin elevated uh, by having a feast day where you just eat a lot of food that day, you, you really feast and you eat, you know, healthier forms of carbs, sweet potatoes, um, beets, carrots, things like that, berries uh, can be actually very beneficial just doing it once a week and then going back to more of a keto approach with uh, intermittent fasting and doing your block fast. And I think you'll see much better results with that. You also may need a little bit of thyroid hormone. A little thyroid hormone support can also be beneficial at times, if depending on what we would see on the labs. All right, let's see. Rubina says, C-reactive protein at 5.6. How can it be reduced? Great question. So how can it be reduced, C-reactive protein? Well, number one is diet and lifestyle, right? Getting that dialed in, really getting your blood sugar in balance, helping heal your gut, taking... Uh, anti-inflammatory nutrients like omega-3 fatty acids, curcumin, um, probiotics, things like that can be all real beneficial. Now, if we want something specifically to target the C-reactive protein, nothing quite like proteolytic enzymes. Okay, well, I would say there's, there's two that I use. I use a high-quality omega-3 fatty acid with curcumin and uh, glutathione. Right, and so we've got something called Pro Omega CRP, which has therapeutic doses of EPA and DHA, long chain omega threes, as well as therapeutic dose of curcumin, the active ingredient in turmeric, and glutathione, your body's master antioxidant. So I would do a double dose on that. I would take three caps, two times daily with food. Okay, do that for three months, and then between meals, I would get are proteo enzymes. Proteo enzymes are basically enzymes that break down proteins. And now, <coughs> excuse me, the key is you've got to take those away from meals. If you take it with a meal, 
it's going to act like a digestive enzyme, which, you know, isn't a problem. It's going to help you digest food better, but you're not going to get the C-reactive protein reducing benefits. If you take it between meals, okay, so like 90 minutes after you meet, you eat, like 90 minutes or, or more between meals, then it's going to get into your bloodstream and start to scavenge proteins, okay? And proteins mean inflammatory uh, molecules like C-reactive protein, right? So it's a protein that happens to be a immune initiator, right? It initiates this inflammatory process in the body. It tells the body where to create inflammation. So when those levels are high, you get more inflammation. The proteolytic enzymes will actually reduce your C-reactive protein levels. Also, if your antibodies are really high, like if you have real high antibodies to your thyroid, um, then these proteolytic enzymes will break down those antibodies because they're proteins as well. So it's a great way to, to you know, get some immediate relief from reducing C-reactive protein or antibodies, things like that, but it doesn't necessarily get to the root cause. So that's why I want to do diet and lifestyle as a foundation, getting your sleep right, your diet right, all those things. And then the pro omega CRP is really good for downregulating these infla the inflammasome, which is basically a number of genetic pathways that amplify inflammation in your body. So hopefully that is helpful for you there. All right, let's see. Jennifer says, hello and thank you. You're very welcome, Jennifer. Great, great that you're on with us here today. Let's see. Melissa says, I work with a fibromyalgia specialist in Birmingham, Alabama. I've been for two years, so much better, but I also love listening to you and learning more here as well. That is awesome. Um, and uh, I think I know who, who you're, you're uh, referring to there as well. So he's a great doctor and I, I would recommend, so that's awesome. So he's a fibromyalgia specialist. Okay, which is fantastic. I think that's Dr. Roger Murphy, I believe, um, out there in Birmingham, Alabama, is excellent, excellent functional medicine doctor. And so glad to hear you're doing well. Okay, let's see. Jennifer says, "What is a healthy triglyceride level? Healthy triglyceride level ideally is going to be between 40 and 80. Okay, 40 and 80 is kind of your ideal. Really under 100 in general." You know, if it gets under 40, I'm thinking that person has got malnourishment. You always should have some circulating triglycerides. You know, it's important for your even your ability to burn fat, right, and bring fat to, to different cells. So um, you shouldn't have it under 40. If, if, that, if you do see that in a lab, it's oftentimes a sign of, again, of like celiac disease, some sort of major leaky gut malnourishment that's taking place. Okay. Dion, do you work out in a fasted state with that spike cortisol? Usually I have 16 hour, 18 hours and would like to work out earlier in the day. It's a good question. I personally do. Um, I work out fasted. Uh, like I haven't worked out yet today and I haven't eaten yet today. And so I'll be working out after this, doing a leg workout today. Um, and so I always do work out in a fasted state. My ketones are elevated. And what I notice is that I'm stronger, I'm more resilient. And um, I need less oxygen, believe it or not, because my body's using ketones as an energy source. Will exercising on a fasted state increase your cortisol? Yes, it will. Um, during that fasted, you know, during that exercise, during that session. Okay, it definitely will. Um, once you get used to fat adaption, your body doesn't see low blood sugar and times of fasting as much as as much of a stress anymore. So in the beginning, it will. And um, because you're so used to these regular feeding periods. So in the beginning, when you first start fasting, it's normal to have a little bit higher cortisol, uh, norepinephrine levels. But over time, as your body gets more fat adapted, gets better at using fat and ketones for energy, then it, it doesn't see it as a threat. It gets used to it, adapts to it. Your body is always going to be adapting to whatever stress. Anything new is a stress. Uh, on the body. And so fasting is a stress when you've never done it before. Over time, as you get more and more used to fasting, get more adapted to it, it becomes less and less of a stress. All right. And so therefore, your body will have uh, more, more of a, uh, a balanced or homeostatic cortisol response, homeodynamic cortisol response to it. Okay. Let's see. Joy says, thank you. I just ordered the autoimmune elimination program. Joy, you're going to enjoy that. It's a great program, a lot of content in there. I always tell my clients, this is like your college course, right? It's like, hey, you know what? If you are sick, if you're struggling with health issues, it's not like you're one pill away, you're one supplement away, you're one superfood away or something like that. 
um, you're really it's it's really a process to get healthy and you've got to look at it like getting a degree in your own health so if you were to go to school and get a bachelor's degree or a master's degree it's gonna take you I mean a minimum to get a degree or a certification in something minimum six months maybe a year maybe multiple years in order to do that so if you want to master your health you need to think about it as a long journey it's gonna take you know, six months to maybe two or two to four years, right? To, to be able to really accomplish that. Now, the good news is in the grand scheme of your life, six months, a year, two years, even four or five years is not that long, right? If you live 60, if you live 80 years, right? Hopefully all of you guys will live 80, 90, 100 years, five years of your life. Let's say you dedicated to learning everything you could about your health. It's such a small percentage, you know, that's like, goodness, you know, five to 10% of your life. Um, and so, you know, just such a small percentage overall, and you carry that with you for the rest of your life, that mastery of your health. So, uh, so such a good uh, strategy. And so in that autoimmune elimination program, I really try to create, you know, the, the foundational nutrition lifestyle program to follow in order to basically help your body overcome autoimmune conditions. Now, in some cases you may need work to work with a advanced practitioner and order a lot routine lab work and things like that, but at least this is the foundational uh, nutrition lifestyle program. So, uh, Joy, you're gonna get a lot out of that. Let's see, Jennifer says, what advice for cholesterol at 280, HDL 103, LDL 167, triglycerides at 54, eat a very healthy plant-based, uh, lean protein plus supplements omega threes. So right there, I can see your HDL is very high. Okay, now tr now she doesn't have an issue with um, blood sugar and um, and insulin resistance because HDL is way over triglycerides. But when I see HDL real high like that, I'm thinking maybe an infection. Okay, so I would think gut, possibly a parasite or um, bacterial overgrowth or something along those lines would be taking place and possibly a thyroid issue too. So I would definitely want to be looking at that, see if she needs thyroid support and also to see if there was something going on in her gut that would cause her HDL to be as high as it is. Because again, that should not definitely not be over 90, certainly not over 100 uh, unless there's something else going on. Let's see, Michael says, Hi from Poland, thanks for your articles. What should I do if I have a HDL of 62, LDL 72, ratio one to one, not one to two? Okay, so yeah, LDL is real low <coughs> compared to HDL. Um, you know, I would recommend adding more healthy fats to your diet. So I would recommend eating a lot of grass-fed butter, pasture-raised eggs, um, coconut oil, avocados, olives, olive oil. That would all be really helpful there, Michael, to help raise that up. Okay, let's see. Crystal says, hello there. I'm stuck at 140 to 145 for the last two months. I'm on an almost daily intermittent fast with keto. I've lost a total of about 35 pounds in the last two years, but I've not been able to break 135. I'm 61 and a half inches, and I'm trying to go back into active duty service. Just kind of hit this weight loss plateau right here. She's doing intermittent fasting with keto. Lost 35 pounds, which is awesome, by the way, Crystal. So great job as far as that goes. Um, I think the biggest thing I would ask is, what does your exercise routine look like? Are you doing resistance training? Um, are you doing fasted exercise? Um, are you overtraining? Maybe you're exercising every day, which I wouldn't recommend. I would recommend doing more like uh, three to four days a week. High intensity, short time period, 15 to 25 minutes maybe, um, and, and rotating between upper and lower body. So one day you're doing upper body, one day you're doing lower body, something along those lines. Um, and then consuming food after, right after that. So you do that in your fully fasted state, well hydrated, and then you consume your meal afterwards. And one thing that also can help would be possibly even some like branched chain amino acids, uh, which can really help stimulate fat burning as well and muscle building. Um, so we have got a product Amino Strong that oftentimes I will take before my workout, fully fasted before my workout. We also actually have a great product called Keto Edge that we actually just out rolled out. Um, you can find that on my website as well. I'll be actually doing a Facebook Live uh, focused on that next week, okay? But these products, Keto Edge has exogenous ketones. It has um, 
a branch chain amino acids in there. It's got adaptogens. So shiitake mushroom, really great for the immune system. Uh, turkey tail mushroom, cordyceps, great for energy and endurance. So doing some stuff like that can be really helpful. Um, and I think that would be extremely helpful for you. And possibly, depending on what you're doing, it might be good to, to cycle in a little bit of carbs, but um, you know, it's a case-by-case -case basis with that. But I would first ask questions related to your exercise levels. Okay. Guys, we've been on a while. Um, I got a workout that I need to get to here, and I just heard my family come home, so I can hear my guys out there, my little boys. And it looks like, sounds like they are ready for lunch. And uh, so I'm gonna have to jump off here. But again, if you're in the Atlanta area, I'm gonna be doing an advanced training on thyroid health tomorrow, 12 o'clock, Exodus Health Center. So check that out. If uh, those of you guys that want more help when it comes to your metabolism, keto coaching, um, overcoming chronic infections, you can always contact me or one of my health coaches and get set up on a health coaching plan. We're happy to help uh, navigate the journey for you guys. And of course, we've also got very low cost digital programs like our autoimmune elimination program um, that Joy just recently purchased. We've got a navigating the ketogenic diet program, cancer cleanse. We've got a lot of great digital programs as well. So check those things out. And uh, you know, I'll definitely be back for at least one, if not two, Facebook lives. I'm planning on doing one on Monday. So look out for that um, Monday around the same time around noon. So um, hopefully I will see you guys there and we'll jump into a little bit more of uh, this, this sort of topic and answering a lot of your questions. So God bless you guys. Hopefully everybody has an amazingly blessed weekend, such a privilege and an honor to share and help you guys out with your health journey. Be blessed.